Well, good morning, church. The weather has finally become warm. I know it's warm this morning and will become warmer this afternoon and evening as we enjoy the coming of a new season. Uh, a couple of things I want to point out. Actually, one, that is on Wednesday nights at 5 o'clock, I am going to start a time of scripture and sharing I'll tell you about in my message. And if you'd like to be part of that, just email me at drstuartbond at gmail.com and I'll make you part of that group uh, uh, chat, Zoom, whatever it is. So I hope you can join me for that. I have one other announcement, but I'm going to save it for my sermon. But I'm going to tell you what I'm hoping that you will do this week. Well, friends, now let us begin our service by enjoying the chimes of the Trinity. Now for our call to worship, let us pray together. Lord, this morning we want everything to be for your glory. We want our thoughts, our words, our songs, our church, our community, our resources, our time, our lives. We want all to be for you. Lord, everything ours is yours. That we come together to declare this to be so on this Sunday, this holy day. Bless our time together with your holy presence. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's enjoy this opening hymn, Praise to the Lord, the Almighty. Adore 
And now we come together for a time of prayer. And uh, would you please bow your head or take your hat off or whatever you need to do as we gather and worship. Lord, you know we are far from perfect. We are far from faithful. We are far from whole. But we come this morning to be restored. We come to be reminded of your presence. We come to be renewed, O God. This morning we lift up our country during this unprecedented time of virus. Guide us, Lord, that our leaders would act with wisdom. We lift up those who are sorrowful or ill. Heal them, Lord, and remind them that you are close. And Lord, we lift ourselves. You know our failures and weaknesses. We commit to you, God, to root out those aspects of our life that lead us away from you and to turn and walk towards you by the power of your Spirit. And so, God, we bring these prayer requests underneath the great prayer that your Son taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Let's enjoy this children's message from Michelle. Good morning, my friends. I bet in school you've learned a lot about the history of the United States. And if so, you've learned that not all of that history were nice things. In fact, there have been a lot of tragic events that happened in our country's history. So tragic that Americans vowed not to forget them. In 1836, a fierce battle between Texan and Mexican soldiers led the Texas soldiers to vow to remember the Alamo. The tragedies of civil war led Abraham Lincoln to remind those gathered at Gettysburg the values our country was founded on four score and seven years ago. A surprise attack on December 7th, 1941 at the U.S. Navy fleet led to the battle cry, remember Pearl Harbor. And the terrorist attacks on New York and Washington, D.C. on September 11th, 2001 made Americans promise we will never forget. But why is it so important for us to remember when bad things happen? Today, we're going to meet back up with Joseph. And you'll remember from last week, he's second in command only to Pharaoh himself. This week, Pastor Stewart's going to tell us how Pharaoh gave his own daughter to be Joseph's wife, that Joseph was very successful at storing food for the famine, and that Joseph even was blessed with two sons. One, he named Manasseh, which literally means making forgetful. And one, he named Ephraim, which means fruitfulness. And in naming Manasseh, Joseph even said that he chose that name because God has made me forget all my toil and all my father's house. What a strange way to name a child and what a strange thing for Joseph to say. First of all, I don't think Joseph had forgotten his past or his father's house. I mean, every time he saw Manasseh, he'd remember his name and why he named him that, right? Second of all, I don't think God wanted Joseph to forget his past. After all, who had been with Joseph during all those hard times? It was God, of course, and God that made him fruitful. See, that sounds a lot like us. A lot of times, bad things happen in our lives, but God uses those to get our attention or teach us a lesson or lead us in a different direction. If Joseph had gotten to choose his path, I don't think he would have chosen slavery and imprisonment, but he might might have also not been second in command to Pharaoh. So God wants us to use the bad things in our past to remember. That's why Americans remember the bad things so that we can teach lessons to our children. 
And the main thing that God wants us to remember when bad things happen is to depend on him, not anything else. Right now, our nation's fighting a disease. The whole world, in fact, is fighting this coronavirus. And I bet it's a time that you won't soon forget. So for our children's church challenge today, I'd like you to take some time and think about what God might want you to remember out of this time. To show kindness, to be patient, to say I love you more, to depend less on things or events to make us happy. Make a list and let's talk about it at our Zoom meeting this afternoon. Would you pray with me? Dear God, we thank you for time with our families and we thank you for time together. We acknowledge that we don't understand your ways and we don't understand how you work always. But God, we thank you that you lead us the way that we need to go. And we ask this week that you would make us to just depend on you for our every need, our every anxiety, our every care, and trust you have a plan and you are in control. And we praise you and thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Have a good week. As you recall, our man Joe has been up and down like a yo-yo. He's like one of those super balls. Do you remember those? Somehow they bounce higher the second time than the first. So Joe hits the bottom in the cistern, and then he rises to the social top as leader of Potiphar's house. Then he goes into prison, and now he has bounced twice as high, rising way past Potiphar's house to be over the entire nation of Egypt. I wonder if any of the social get-togethers of the elite, if they ever became awkward when Joseph and 
Mr. Potiphar accidentally met at the punch bowl. Joseph has finally made it. Our story for today lays out all that he now acquires. Verse 41, so Pharaoh said to Joseph, I hereby put you in charge of the whole land of Egypt. Then Pharaoh took his signet ring from his finger and put it on Joseph's finger. He dressed him in robes of fine linen and put a gold chain around his neck. He had him ride in a chariot as his second in command, and people shouted before him, Make way! Thus he put him in charge of the whole land of Egypt. Then Pharaoh said to Joseph, I am Pharaoh, but without your word not no one will lift hand or foot in all Egypt. Pharaoh gave Joseph the name Zaphnath Paniah, and gave him Asenath, daughter of Potiphar, priest of On, to be his wife. And Joseph went throughout the land of Egypt. Joseph was 30 years old when he entered the service of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. And Joseph went out from Pharaoh's presence and traveled throughout Egypt. During the seven years of abundance, the land produced plentifully. Joseph collected all the food produced in those seven years of abundance in Egypt and stored it in the cities. In each city, he put the food grown in the fields surrounding it. Joseph stored up huge quantities of grain, like the sand of the sea. It was so much that he stopped keeping records because it was beyond measure. Before the years of famine came, two sons were born to Joseph by Asenath, uh, daughter of Potiphar, priest of On. Joseph named his first Manasseh and said, It is because God has made me forget all my troubles and all my father's household. The second son he named Ephraim and said, It is because God has made me fruitful in the land of my suffering. The seven years of abundance in Egypt came to an end, and the seven years of famine began, just as Joseph had said. There was famine in all the other lands, but in the whole land of Egypt, there was food. When all Egypt began to feel the famine, the people cried to Pharaoh for food. Then Pharaoh told all the Egyptians, go to Joseph and do what he tells you. When the famine had spread over the whole country, Joseph opened all the storehouses and sold grain to the Egyptians, for the famine was severe throughout Egypt. And all the world came to Egypt to buy grain from Joseph, because the famine was severe everywhere. Let us pray. And so God, allow this wonderful story to speak its truth into our hearts and lives. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. If this were today, we might say that Joseph had gone from being in jail to having his own personal limo service and a detail of agents to serve him. He had the authority of the president behind him, and he is the architect for domestic and foreign policy for his nation for the next 14 years. Not bad for a guy who is now all of 30 years old. I'm sure those first seven years were a rocket ride for him of planning and thinking through how to prepare for those next seven. You can also imagine that the people started to wonder a little about the dream. I mean, after seven good years, you tend to think you will have seven more. But like the stock market, what goes up must come down. And when it did, Joseph was ready. Their storehouses of grain were the envy of the nations. He had the very thing the market wanted at a time when everyone else was out of stock. So Egypt made all kinds of money, plus their people were well fed. We also see that Joseph is embraced by his adopted culture. The land that has brought him from slave to sovereign gives him a new name. Now scholars aren't exactly sure 
of what the name means, but one commentator says it probably meant something like the one who knows. I like it. It is saying this guy, he's the smart guy. Notice too that he has a high class wife and two adorable kids. He has the ideal family with the famous 2.4 children in the back. As Pharaoh's COO, he has a wife and kids, a great ride, and a wonderful home. You might say Joseph has become a Presbyterian. That is almost what I was going to call this sermon, Joseph as a Presbyterian. Now you might not quite get the connection. I don't mean that Joseph believes in the leadership of elders and the church as we know it. I mean that Joseph, well, he's like most of us. That is, he has made it. Now, you might demur a bit. Well, I wouldn't say I've made it, but I'm doing all right. Yes, you are. We have all heard how the virus is only illustrating the divide in the society between the haves and the have-nots. One of those divides is at work right now. If you have internet, you are one of the haves. If you have food in your refrigerator and you are not worried about paying your mortgage this month, you are a have. If the bill collectors are not calling you, or even if they are in many cases, you are still a have. Many of us are retired with income that is not threatened by the pandemic. Others of us are able to work from home and our biggest risk of the week is going to the grocery store. There is no comparison to, say, the workers in the meat packing plants. Statisticians recently measured the difference between life expectancies between the haves and have-nots in New York City, and it is more than 20 years of life. So what, you might ask? There have always been haves and have-nots. Jesus said that the poor will be with you always, didn't he? Well, yes, that's true. And it is good to remember how the rest of that verse goes in Scripture. Jesus was quoting Deuteronomy 15.11. There will always be poor people in the land. Therefore, I command you to be open-handed toward your fellow Israelites who are poor and needy in your land. We'll come back to this later. What I want to speak about this morning is the title I have chosen to give my sermon instead. It's not as clever as Joseph as a Presbyterian, but it gets to the central point. I am calling this the curse of comfort. What is this curse and how does it work? We find this theme of concern for we who are experiencing the comforts of life, we find this throughout the scriptures. In Deuteronomy 6, God speaks to his people on what it means to love God once they have achieved their goal of living in that land of milk and honey. When the Lord your God brings you into the land, he swore to your fathers, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, to give you a land with large, flourishing cities you did not build. A house, houses filled with all kinds of good things you did not provide. Wells you did not dig. And vineyards and olive groves you did not plant. Then, when you eat and are satisfied, be careful that you do not forget the Lord who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. What is the concern that he points to in this passage. Just this. That when God has done great things for us, and when we are finally setting pretty in our homes, with our crops producing and rain falling on our fields, as it were, that we will forget. We will forget 
that God has given us that which we did not build. The concern for Joseph is that once he has all the trappings of the culture, that he will be enculturated. He will accept the values of that land, and almost certainly he will turn away from his God. One sign of that turning away is the natural response we might have to this idea that we have been given so much. We might respond in pride, God didn't give me anything. I did it myself. What does that response mean? It means we forgot. It means that we are no longer grateful for the many benefits and legs up that we have received for the opportunities that came our way. It doesn't mean that we didn't work hard for what we have. I'm sure Joseph burned the midnight oil, literally. He gave it all he could. It doesn't mean there is something wrong with us, but here is the truth. Like gravity, our spiritual vision gets pulled down from setting our eyes on Him to looking in the mirror to all we have done and patting ourselves on the back. This is Jesus with the young man I like to call Richard Y. Ruler. That young man asks what he needs to do to achieve eternal life. What does Jesus say? He says, obey the commandments. And the young man's response is so telling. I've done all of that. Now, what does that answer mean? It means that his riches have blinded him to the truths of God. It means he has no real sense of who he is before the Lord. I mean, who of us has completely mastered that command, that commandment about not coveting what others have? Who of us would say that we are perfect in loving God or that a few idols don't get in our way now and again? And what is Jesus' solution? Sell everything and follow me. We have need to think about that story a lot. Am I letting my resources and my comfort keep me from being spiritually alert? Am I forgetting the Lord my God simply because I now live in a land of milk and honey? So how do we have, we who know comfort, how do we keep our spiritual vision sharp? So first we realize we are in a foreign land. Second, we live in touch with God. In this pandemic, the one longing most of us share is that we wish we could see one another. We wish we could be more easily in touch. We miss the comfort of camaraderie and, and an easy conversation where no masks are involved. Well, are you in touch with the Lord? Are you asking Him to speak into your life on a daily basis? Do you let His Word work its way into the creases of your soul? I don't mean that every hour is a Bible study, but we need to strengthen our connection with God in these days when we are so isolated. Make sure that your soul is enlivened instead of deadened. Psalm 5 reads, In the morning, Lord, you hear my voice. In the morning, I lay my request before you and wait expectantly. To this end, I realize that we are bereft of those weekly teachings and inputs that we have in our regular church offerings. In these extraordinary times, we need to try some new things. So, here is something new. I invite you to join me on Wednesday at 5 o'clock for a half hour of connection and scripture and sharing some thoughts. Just email me and you can be part of this. In this matter of staying in touch with the Lord, I was very interested in how Joseph named his children. Manasseh reminded him of God's faithfulness. God has made me forget all my troubles in my father's house. 
I give thanks to God for healing of my past. His second child is named Ephraim because it reminded him that all the successes he knew were because God had made him successful in the land of his suffering. Now, I'm not asking you to rename your children. I'm asking you to do the work of connecting to God so that the values that he has built into your life are always front and center. Third, practice generosity. I return to that verse that Jesus quoted. It was Deuteronomy 15. Let me read the whole paragraph. If anyone is poor among your fellow Israelites in any of the towns of the land the Lord your God is giving you, do not be hard-hearted or tight-fisted toward them. Rather, be open-handed and freely lend them whatever they need. Be careful not to harbor this wicked thought. The seventh year, the year for canceling debts is near so that you do not show ill will towards the needy among your fellow Israelites and give them nothing. They may then appeal to the Lord against you, and you will be found guilty of sin. Give generously to them, and do so without a grudging heart. Then, because of this, the Lord your God will bless you in all your work and in everything you put your hand to. There will always be poor in the land. Therefore, I command you to be open-handed toward your fellow Israelites who are poor and needy in your land. You get a whole new perspective on that verse when you read it in context, don't you? One part of giving generously, of helping others in need, is that it saves the haves as well as the have-nots. Our own souls will shrink if we are not finding a way to bless others and to serve someone else. We all need to practice generosity. In fact, we have one easy way for our church to represent generosity to our community. We're going to start a restaurant program. Here's the program. Once a week, I will announce a restaurant that we want to bless. This week, it is Main Street Pizza. You might know it. It's right next to Whataburger on Main Street. John Abraham is the owner and new manager there. It's a great name, isn't it? You cannot get more biblical than that. I was, went to the restaurant. I talked to him. And he didn't quite understand what to do with me. So do you want to order pizza? I said, no. I'm a pastor. And I want to tell my church to order from you all this next week. He kind of stopped in his tracks. He was just on the phone with the phone company to get the message system started up again. He looked at me and said, that would be so great. Listen, I, I can offer you guys a discount. I said, I don't want any discount. You might be saying, Pastor Stewart, we'd like a discount. No, I said, I don't want any discount. We just want to bless you. He paused again. And then he repeated, that would be so great. So listen, if you don't want to make your pastor look like a fool, when you're ordering one of your takeout meals this week, get one of them from Main Street Pizza. The curse of comfort. I'm sure you would say that if you have to be cursed with something, let it be comfort. And I agree. I like sleeping in a nice bed and to have what I want to eat and to be able to drive a car that runs well. I like all of those things. And in particular, I do use the internet a lot. But I also want to remember that this world is not my home. And I want to use my time to stay in touch with the Lord. And I do want to be caring and generous with my time, my skills, and my resources. And I'll bet you do too. Amen? Amen. Well, let's join together as we say the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, 
was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. I've asked David to sing, Give Me Jesus. This hymn came, of course, from the times of slavery. There were these people who had been taken from their homeland, stripped of their freedom, had no possessions to speak of, and yet there was one thing they held on to. It is the have-nots reminding we haves what truly matters. love that refrain. You can have this whole world, but give me Jesus. And now, friends, receive this benediction. Go out into this world with this one thought. 
I love these people. I love this place. But this world is not my home. And these idols, they are not my God. And if I can be of service to someone in need, Lord, let me be that. Let me do that. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, and all of God's tremendous people said, Amen. God bless you all, and have a great week.